Good morning and welcome to the seventh meeting in 2016 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Can I please remind all members to turn off mobile phones, uh, tablets, electronic devices and indeed all members of the public too. Um, the first item on our agenda to decide whether to take item three in private. Are members agreed? Yes. yes. Members are agreed. Our second item of business is to take evidence on Scotland's fiscal framework. Regrettably, the Chief Secretary of the Treasury declined our invitation to appear before the committee today. However, he's previously indicated that he'll be happy to attend once the framework has been agreed, and therefore, given the time, tight timescales involved for scrutiny, we'll invite him to attend our next meeting on the 2nd of March. We will now take evidence from the Deputy First Minister. Mr Swinney is joined today by Alistair Brown, Deputy Director, Fiscal Responsibility Division from the Scottish Government. I'd like to welcome our witnesses to the meeting and invite Mr Swinney to make an opening statement. John. Hey, thank you, Kavira. I'm grateful to members of the Finance Committee for their work to date in examining the proposals for a fiscal framework. And in light of yesterday's announcement to the Parliament, I very much welcome this early opportunity to provide further detail to the Committee. Paragraph 94 of the Smith Commission report recommended that the devolution of further tax and spending powers to the Scottish Government should be accompanied by an updated fiscal framework for Scotland. It is the framework that will determine how the powers proposed by the Smith Commission can be used, and so it is as important, if not more so, than the Scotland Bill itself. My overarching aim has been to ensure that the new fiscal framework is fair and workable and is in line with the principles set out in the Smith Commission report. On the 7th of October, I set out to Parliament the areas where we needed to reach agreement as part of an acceptable fiscal framework. These were on the block grant adjustment for tax, on the implementation and ongoing costs associated with the devolution of welfare benefits, and securing additional capital and resource borrowing powers. I have engaged constructively in the fiscal framework negotiations and met with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury on 10 occasions through the Joint Exchequer Committee. Over recent days, the First Minister and I have continued to work with the UK Government to secure a fair deal, and we have both discussed the detail of the fiscal framework with the Chancellor of the Exchequer. As a result of these discussions, significant progress has been made across all of the key areas of the fiscal framework, and the Committee will know from the First Minister's supplementary statement to Parliament last night there is on the table an agreement in principle that I believe we can recommend to Parliament. A draft heads of agreement will be published for scrutiny by Parliament by the end of this week. We sought a fiscal framework that gave the Scottish Government the flexibility it needs to create a fair and prosperous Scotland and the ability to use the powers we have in an effective way. To get to this point, we have all had to compromise. There has been give and take as we worked our way through the deal, but I refuse to compromise on one key area, the area of no detriment. Smith said the Barnett formula should determine the size of the block grant. That is the benchmark against which we must assess the operation of no detriment. The fiscal framework should not seek to undermine the operation of the Barnett formula as the basis for determining public expenditure in Scotland. Crucially, Smith identified that Scotland's budget should be no larger or smaller simply as a result of the initial transfer of powers. We have reached an agreement on the block grant which involves using the UK Government comparability model that will be configured to deliver the Scottish Government's preferred option of per capita index deduction. Under this proposal, there will not be a single penny of detriment to the Scottish Government's budget as a result of the devolution of powers during the transition period for the next six years to March 2022. The UK Government will guarantee that the outcome of the Scottish Government's preferred funding model per capita index deduction is delivered in each of these years. Alongside this, there will be a review that will be informed by an independent report with recommendations presented to both governments by the end of 2021. The fiscal framework will not include or assume the method for adjusting the block grant beyond this transitional period. The two governments will be required to jointly agree that method as part of the review, and this must deliver results consistent with the Smith Commission's recommendations, including the principles of taxpayer fairness, economic responsibility, and crucially, the principle of no detriment. This secures no detriment now and for the next six years, and we have ensured that there could be no detriment imposed on Scotland at any point in the future. On capital borrowing, we have agreed to increase the Scottish Government's capital borrowing limits to £3 billion, uh, a cumulative £3 billion, with annual flexibility of 15% of that. This increases our annual capital borrowing facility to £450 million to invest in infrastructure in Scotland and so improve economic performance. On resource borrowing, we will receive the powers necessary to manage tax volatility and economic shocks by increasing the resource borrowing limits set out in the Scotland Act 
alongside introducing a new Scottish reserve. The borrowing limit for forecast error will be £300 million per annum. The aggregate annual limit for forecast error and economic shock will be set at £600 million, and the overall resource debt limit will be £1.75 billion. On implementation and administration costs, we have agreed a one-off payment of £200 million to support implementation costs and ongoing funding of £66 million per annum. The Committee will be keen to hear that I have also agreed the Scottish Fiscal Commission will produce the official forecasts of GDP and tax revenues, and I will bring forward appropriate amendments at Stage 3 of the Scottish Fiscal Commission Bill to give effect to these provisions. This all forms the basis of the fiscal framework that is true to the principles of Smith. This deal will ensure that the funding for Scotland cannot be changed without the Scottish Government's agreement. It protects the Barnet formula and it will allow the powers in the Scotland Bill to be delivered. Uh, I am acutely aware that not all of the detail is in front of the Committee today, uh, but I will make every effort, once the material is published, to be available to appear before the Committee, if that would be the Committee's wish, to look at the further detail once it is published in the course of this week. Thank you very much for that opening statement. Um, <clears throat> and I think we're all delighted that an agreement has actually uh, been reached. I mean, you, you, you talked through a number of areas. I mean, you made it quite clear that the Scottish Government did not compromise on the issue of no detriment, but clearly on issues of other areas, such as the Scottish Fiscal Commission um, and borrowing, there have been um, uh, obviously uh, some compromise. I wonder if there are any other further compromises that have been made that you would wish to um, advise the committee of? Obviously, there's um, in the process of the negotiations, um, the Scottish Government has advanced particular propositions where we were trying to secure um, the uh, agreement. For example, um, on borrowing, I argued for a higher limit than three, than three billion pounds, but I accepted that um, uh, there had to be. Uh, the Smith Commission report requires this of me that the borrowing arrangement had to be consistent with the chosen fiscal framework of the United Kingdom. And I have to, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to argue as strongly as I have argued for the implementation of the Smith Commission report, I have to accept if there are constraining factors, I have to live within those. So I've compromised on the total debt limit that I would have liked to have seen. Um, I've compromised on the um, the degree to which um, the, the the, the annual uh, constraints within capital borrowing uh, and a variety of other issues. But fundamentally, I, I think you, you have to take a step back from the, uh, the conclusions and say in the round, is this, a, is this a reasonable package that can be recommended to Parliament? And in my judgment, it, it forms that basis. OK, thank you. And on borrowing, uh, uh, the issue of prudential borrowing, of course, um, prudential borrowing is not going to be uh, one of the aspects of the framework, is it? Won't be no. Uh, there will be um, there will be a, 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 an aggregate limit set on borrowing of three billion pounds, which is an increase from the two point two billion that was proposed by the Kalman Commission, um, and and most significantly, um, an expansion of the annual borrowing facility that we can undertake. The the, the borrowing that we can undertake in 2016-17 is £316 million. Um, the new facility will take that up to 450. So there is increased capacity there to undertake capital borrowing. Um, we, uh, one of the um, easier issues for us to resolve um, in the process was around resource borrowing, where um, I think the, uh, the Treasury, um, the Chief Secretary took, um, you know, entirely understandable view about the, uh, the, the risks of volatility to which the Scottish Government would be increasingly exposed and, again, the facilities that um, have been offered in that respect um, have, uh, are, in my view, uh, appropriate in, in the circumstances. Okay, now you talked a lot about the fact that uh, you know, um, Scotland will not, be, um, uh, will not suffer detriment to the tune of one penny, but there are a number of issues that came out over the last uh, couple of weeks, actually, which raised alarm bells. For example, SCVO talked about employability uh, being devolved, uh, with £100 million worth of employability being devolved, but only £7 million being devolved to go with it. So in terms of issues like that, and in terms of uh, welfare, where also there were considerable concerns that the full cost of the devolution of welfare um, would, would um, not be met. What, what's the position on those? I know, I, I know you've uh, mentioned some £200 million and set up costs in £66 million a year, but I'm just wondering what that encompasses and, and, and where employability and welfare fit in with those. Um, if I could separate those, those issues out, convener, on employability, um, the, the, 
Well, could, could I I'll make a, a preliminary remark? Um, my, my comments in relation to the exercise of the no detriment principle is in relation to the, 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 the block grant and um, the employability expenditure is out with the block grant. So the, the, the point on, on no detriment of there being not a pound lost from the Scottish block um, is, 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 is the relevance and the reference point of, of that argument. Employability is slightly different. Um, the Smith Commission report said that the employability programmes should be um, devolved to Scotland with the appropriate funding streams um, at the conclusion of the contract. Um, as members will be aware, we expected those contracts to conclude in April of this year, in April 2016. They have in fact been extended, um, so therefore the, the, the moment of devolution becomes later than, we, than was envisaged by the Smith Commission. By the time it comes to the point of devolution, the United Kingdom Government will have taken decisions within their own competence to reduce the size of employability programmes within the United Kingdom with a consequent effect in Scotland. So in short, by the time it comes to the, the moment of devolution, the employability programmes will be um, diminished compared to what they were when the Smith Commission took its view. And the argument which has been advanced by the Treasury is that the funding that should be devolved is the funding devolved at the point of devolution, not at the point of agreement to devolve. Now, that's an issue in which the Chief Secretary and I did not, were not agreed. Um, but it's an issue which, um, in the round of compromises, I have had to accept that um, the when it gets to the moment of devolution, the spending by the UK government on employability programmes will be significantly diminished on what it was at the time of the uh, of the Smith Commission report, and um, uh, and 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 that will be the the consequential funding stream that will come to Scotland um, as a result. And we expect that in 2017-18 to be seven million pounds, in 18-19 10 million pounds. In 1920, 11 million pounds, and in 2020, 21, 13 million pounds. And of course, the Scottish government will then have the responsibility for employability programmes, but we will not necessarily, we will certainly not have the funding streams that would have been envisaged by the Smith Commission in 2014. You asked finally, convener, about um, the issues in relation to um, administration costs. Um, there are um, costs associated with the set up of um, new systems in relation to welfare and some other um, activities in relation to um, the uh, cost of administration. Um, we agreed a one-off capital figure for that of £200 million, which would be transferred to the Scottish Government, um, supported by uh, an annual figure of £66 million on an ongoing basis to support the operation of these, uh, these programmes in the years to come. And um, how realistic is that in terms of the ability to deliver these programmes? The DWP's estimate for the setup of the equivalent systems in Scotland was £350 million. So we have secured more than half of that capital cost. Now, that, uh, the Scottish Government's est the lowest estimate we had for the setup costs was £400 million. Um, I was mindful of the, again, from the Smith Commission report that the Smith Commission argued that the UK government should pay a share of the setup and implementation costs, not them all. Um, so I, again, I had to be mindful of the fact that if I was holding to the details of the Smith Commission report, um, I had to do that on a basis that was fair and sustainable. And the 66 million, how realistic is that in terms of the ability to deliver? The a DWP estimate of the cost of administering these systems in Scotland um, was £60 million, um, with a marginal saving of an additional £12 million. And um, in, you know, as is customary on block grant adjustment issues, we decided to split the difference on the additional 12 and added that to the 60. Um, it wouldn't be any block grant adjustment without a difference being split at some stage in the process. So the Scottish Government is reasonably content with that, and, it, and obviously, you're, you're, given that your borrowing is going up to four hundred and fifty million, I think you, you, you take the view that you'll be able to fund the setup costs of that new system. D d well, I, I'm, I'm going to come at this from the point of view that I don't believe it's a given that it's got to cost us more than two hundred million pounds. 
Um, so we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll... 100 million... Was well, that was, that was the estimate that we yeah. had, but yeah. that doesn't necessarily mean we've got to spend that. Okay. Um, so in the way in which I take forward these priorities, if I'm in a position to so do, um, after the election, then we'll be doing that in a fashion to try to um, control the costs as the committee would expect us to do. OK, one of the issues in our report on the fiscal framework was the issue of moral hazard. And uh, what we said was that the issue of moral hazard needs to be explicitly addressed in the fiscal framework. Just wondering um, how that has been expressed in the framework. Um, we, we, we're not at the conclusion of the, um, the drafting of the, the heads of agreement. Um, I certainly reflect on that point as we look at the finalisation of the, the heads of agreement document. OK, that's fine. OK, well, there's a, quite a, a lot of uh, members want to come in with questions here, so let's um, start with Gavin, to be followed by Mark. Well, thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary. I was, uh, I was pleased that you were able to give a bit more detail than I expected this morning, uh, so I just want to, to probe, if I can, on some of it. In, in terms of capital borrowing, you outlined what the changes would be. When do they take effect? Are they, do they, would they take effect potentially in the budget we're about to vote on today, or are we talking about 17, 18... Uh, they, well, they, they couldn't take effect until the Scotland Act has, at least, at the very least, until the Scotland Act has got royal assent, which will be, well, well I wouldn't imagine will be before the 1st of April. So um, I, I would imagine that um, the commencement, actually, if Mr Brown will just give me one second, actually, I have some further handwritten notes which will help me here. Um, uh, April 2017 for the borrowing part, I see. That sentence so fast. Okay. Yeah. Um, in terms of the resource borrowing, you mentioned a number of limits. I just want to make sure I took these down correctly because I was scribbling quite furiously. Uh, £300 million pounds per annum. Help, convener. I'm happy to provide a note to the committee. Well, there will be a, a note sure. I said earlier on. But yeah. 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 Okay. It, it, in terms of resource, so it's £300 million pounds per annum for forecast errors. Correct. Okay. Then there was a figure of six million, six hundred million pounds. Was that uh, for economic shocks? Uh, uh, combined, uh, forecast error and economic, and economic shock. shock. So that includes yeah. the so three hundred so million. So the three hundred million is a subset, subset of the six hundred. Okay, and then there was a figure of one point seven five billion. What of was a cumulative debt stock, which could be uh, built up as a consequence of resource borrowing. Okay, and uh, for completeness, I should say that the repayment period for that 1.75 billion uh, debt stock is um, between three and five years to be determined by Scottish ministers. Three to five years. Okay. Right. Thank you. Um, okay, that's resource borrowing. In terms of the, the Scottish Fiscal Commission, I mean, as you know, I, I've had an interest in seeing the official forecast done by them, um, and I was pleased to hear that you're going to lodge amendments. Just, just for completeness, though, I mean, in terms of parliamentary timetable, you would have to lodge them on the Friday, midday on the Friday before stage three, which I think is two weeks tomorrow. Um, you would traditionally, the government put them in the day before to allow other members. Uh, are, are you willing to discuss the matter just so that uh, I, I don't wait until the Thursday to see them and say, oh, right, actually, there's something else I think ought to go in. Are, are you open to, to having uh, discussions so that these, uh, that I don't have to check them at the last minute and I want to do something different. Given that given that Mr Brown has put such industry into this proposition, I'm very very happy to have that conversation and uh, with any members yeah, sure. actually. I, you know, I, I, I recognise uh, the committee's interest, not least the interest of the, co the convener on this particular issue and uh, I'm certainly very happy to um, engage in some discussion uh, offline on what that would do. I, I think we, we, we we are still working through the detailed provisions of what is expected. I, I, th this has been an area where I um, have been keen to um, agree with the Treasury the issues that matter to them. Um, what I have resisted is essentially uh, comprising the Scottish Fiscal Commission on an identical basis to the OBR. So, for example, one of the issues the Treasury advanced with me was the need to have non-executive directors of the OBR. And I don't think they'd quite understood the fact that there are three commissioners who are appointed by Parliament over whom the government has no control who exercises this function. So I think that the key issue which I've agreed with the Treasury is that 
the forecasts of revenues and the, the uh, and and um, GDP. and GDP must be undertaken by um, an independent body, and that's that will be what will be the focus of my attention in drafting the amendments at stage three. I'm not particularly, I'm not really at all keen to reconstruct the fiscal commission because it is operating independently. It will obviously have to be resourced to exercise the functions that will now be falling upon it. Um, but the, the very precise uh, agreements we've arrived at have been in relation to um, the, the issues of forecast, which I know has been material to the committee and to Mr Brown. Well, uh, thank you. Um, one, of the, one of the things the committee concluded in our uh, fiscal report, or fiscal framework report, was that there, there ought to be some discussion of fiscal rules um, were there any, maybe you can't tell us until the end of the week, but were there any fiscal rules agreed between the Scottish Government and UK Government as part of the fiscal framework? I think I'd say that, that there are, I think I've gone through a few fiscal rules uh, about capital borrowing limits, resource borrowing limits, um, repayment periods. These are all, these, the, the, these are the, 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 this, this is the architecture of fiscal rules. So, you know, if, if, if there's a requirement to have, for example, a debt repayment and resource borrowing over a period of three to five years, that's, a, that's an obligatory fiscal rule within, and you know, limits within which we've got to operate. So um, I think in, in, to that extent, um, yes, there are fiscal rules. I, I haven't gone through with the committee convener the details around the Scotland Reserve. So th this essentially will um, draw together the current cash reserve provision which was created by the um, Scotland Act 2012, the budget exchange mechanism facility that we currently have and it will create a single Scotland reserve that will be capped in aggregate at £700 million with an annual drawdown maximum from the cash reserve of £250 million for resource and £100 million for capital. So. That's, I would consider those to be other aspects of fiscal rules that will uh, define the, um, the arrangements within which we operate. Okay, thank you. And just finally, in terms of, of, of how matters now progress, I mean, obviously this committee will, will conduct scrutiny, the devolution for the power committees will conduct scrutiny and, and maybe other committees uh, will do some scrutiny as well. Legislation, I understand, isn't formally required. So what, what happens at the end of this process? Do you simply lodge a motion uh, in Parliament that Parliament votes on, or what, what do you envisage being the kind of uh, mechanism for, for sign-off, if you like, by Parliament? The, uh, essentially, the, 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 obviously, the, this committee, um, if I understand the process correctly, is feeding its input into the Devolution for the Powers Committee, who are the lead committee for consideration of the legislative consent motion. Um, the, as I indicated in my opening remarks, I now consider us to be in a position where we can recommend the, Scot the Scotland Bill for legislative consent, subject, of course, to the scrutiny that's applied by committees. Um, and as I, I think, um, as I made clear to the Devolution for the Powers Committee yesterday, I have been um, a conscious of the forbearance of parliamentary committees and not been able to actually scrutinise um, hard detail. Um, that will become available um, with the heads of agreement in the course of the next um, couple of days. And um, that, would, uh, that would enable uh, the scrutiny to be undertaken. As I indicated again in my opening statement, I, I recognise the constraints and timings that have been created, so I'll make myself available at any time to come to the committee if, it, if the committee wishes to see me again on these questions. Um, and then we would recommend the Bill for Legislative Consent. I think in terms of legislative change, uh, I'm led to believe that there are um, technical amendments that the United Kingdom government believes it requires to make to the Scotland Bill in the House of Lords to, make if, take if, to ensure the capital borrowing provisions can take effect. And um, uh, obviously th there will be the usual intergovernmental dialogue around the contents of those amendments before they're lodged. Thank you. Good, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mark. Be followed by Jackie. Uh, thank you very much, Convener, and um, good morning, Deputy First Minister. It's good good to see that we have a deal. If for no other reason than I questioned you 24 hours ago in this room, and it would have started to feel like Groundhog Day otherwise. So, um, but I wondered if I could maybe look at a couple of bits of the detail uh, in relation to to what's been agreed. Um, obviously, yesterday um, Willie Rennie expressed some concern, and he's reiterated that today. 
about the way at which the model for the transitional period has been arrived at. Um, in, in what you've said today, you've said that effectively um, it is per capita index deduction by any other by another name. I wonder if you could just go into the detail of, of how that, that is arrived at. Essentially, the, um, what we have agreed to is to use what has been uh, described by the Treasury as um, their comparable model, which looks at the share of taxation and the different taxes, income tax, SDLT, landfill tax, VAT, APD and aggregates tax, which emanates from Scotland and essentially creates um, the, uh, the, uh, a, a block grant adjustment accordingly. Um, the, if that was to be applied, it would deliver, uh, and it, if it was to be applied in the fashion proposed by the Treasury, it would deliver detriment to the Scottish budget. So the, and we couldn't agree to that. So what we agreed to was uh, the, um, variation of that model to deliver the outcome that would be created by per capita index deduction. So the key point here, uh, what is delivered? What is the impact on the money? And the impact on the money is driven by per capita index deduction. And that's what we wanted to secure and we've secured it. And that's where the basis of no detriment comes from. So essentially, um, we have got either an elegant or an inelegant route to get to per capita index deduction. <clears throat> and presumably the, the further check built in, because obviously the, I think the concern that Willard Rennie was expressing was that because the Treasury model was what underlies this, that that could pose problems post the transitional period. But the independent review, which requires both governments to agree, would presumably act as a, a check against that. Um, I just wondered on the independent review, obviously this committee has uh, expressed its view in the past for some form of arbitration mechanism for disagreements that occur between Scottish Government and Treasury. Do you envisage that through the independent review process that might provide a model for something similar to emerge in, in future years? I, I don't think that's the case because um, essentially what the agreement cements is an important principle that I secured agreement about in the Smith Commission. The crucial difference that has happened in this agreement is that the Smith Commission, at my request, agreed that whatever fiscal rules were put in place, they had to be agreed jointly between the Scottish and United Kingdom governments as equals. So essentially, for the first time, we could not have something imposed upon us. That's the origins of the negotiating strength that the Scottish Government has had in this agreement. And what I was anxious to ensure by agreeing to this particular uh, block grant adjustment mechanism is that that facility, that opportunity, that equality of status was protected for the future and it is cemented into this agreement. Protected into the future that in 2022 when the review takes place, when both governments receive the independent report, both governments have got to agree to the mechanism that creates the independent report, both governments have got to receive it, and both governments have got to agree any reaction to it. And that equality of status between the Scottish Government and the United Kingdom governments in that respect has been cemented into this agreement. And that is why I think, it's why, that's basically why I feel able to recommend this for legislative consent and why I don't believe there's any foundation whatsoever to the remarks that have been made by Mr Rennie. That, that, that's, that's appreciated. In terms of the independent review, um, obviously we took evidence last night at the Devolution and Further Powers Committee from the Secretary of State for Scotland and for obvious reasons he couldn't go into issues around composition of who would undertake the review because it's you know five, five years into the future. But in terms of how it will be composed, will that be something that both governments will jointly agree in terms of who will be the, the individuals or organisations to undertake that independent review? Yeah, that's correct, yes. Okay. Um, and just lastly, um, in terms of timeline, um, I, I obviously last night um, at the Devolution of Further Powers Committee, the Secretary of State outlined what he envisaged as the timeline for when powers would come into effect uh, in, in this Parliament. You, you've helpfully highlighted when you, when you consider borrowing powers what will come into effect. Um, he envisaged that some powers 
would be available to the Parliament in April 2017. Others may take a little bit longer. I noted on the radio this morning that you disagreed with some of that analysis by Mr Mundell in terms of the readiness of this Parliament to exercise some of those powers by April 2017. I just wondered if you could maybe uh, expand on that for the, for the benefit of the record. Uh, certainly. Uh, my, what I've agreed with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury is that um, income tax will be um, able to be, the powers will be able to be exercised in April 2017, APD in April 2018, on borrowing powers April 2017, on welfare powers um, we'll have to essentially do some further work on when that can practically be undertaken but the uh, approach will be informed by the um, output of the Joint Ministerial Committee on Welfare. On the, on the welfare powers, because one of the questions last night was whether um, they would all transfer as a basket of powers or whether those powers which were more easily devolved early could be, could be devolved early or whether, whether given the administrative element you would want it all passed as a, as a basket. I, I, think we'd, I, I think we would have to look carefully at all of the operational arrangements here because we are dealing with benefits to individuals and um, both governments would have to be satisfied. It's, I suppose it's no different to, well it is, it's very different actually to, um, to um, the stamp duty provisions but there is a similarity if that's not a contradiction in terms. Uh, there had to be a switch off of stamp duty to enable land buildings transaction tax to be switched on and so both governments, one government's got to be ready to start up, one government's got to be ready to shut down. Um, the same thing applies on welfare benefits, apart from the fact it's more significant because it's people's livelihoods and their the income to, on which they are dependent. So we have to be absolutely certain that on any benefit we've got the necessary arrangements in place. So uh, I, I'm satisfied that the arrangements we have on the welfare powers, they will require negotiation and dialogue, but I, I'm, I, I see no practical impediment to that being undertaken. Um, and. Uh, VAT assignment we expect uh, probably in the financial year 2019-20. Okay, uh, can I ask just in terms of the VAT assignment what, what the reason for that being devolved at that stage rather than at the, the beginning of the process would be? Essentially it's the, the need to make sure we have uh, a strong methodological and database to enable us to do that because that is, that is what that is not currently undertaken just now. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Jack, to follow by Jean. Just pick up on on the last point about welfare first. Um, my experience is it's easier to switch off than it is to switch on. So I'm assuming this is about us testing our readiness um, to accept those benefits. Would that be fair? Well, well yes, because we've got to. You know, we've got. To, we'll, we will be the paying authority. So yeah, we we have to be able to pay. So we have to make sure that those arrangements are, are effectively in place. Okay. Do, have you got a timetable in mind? Not at this stage, but obviously the government will be wanting to exercise those powers as quickly as we can. But we have to do them. Jackie B will understand that we have to do that in a in a fashion that means we can actually deliver on these commitments. Of course, of course. Can I um, welcome? I should have done this at the beginning. Welcome the agreement reached and welcome the cabinet secretary's change of heart or compromise, whichever it is, on the Scottish Fiscal Commission, um, because I think doing the independent official forecasting is absolutely the right thing to do. So I'm glad he is persuaded of it now. Um, obviously, publishing the detail of precisely what that will mean before stage two would be extraordinarily helpful. And I heard a commitment to do so, I think, by the end of this week. The heads of agreement will be published by the end of this week and that will include um, what agreements we've arrived at with the UK government on that particular question. And uh, as I said in my early response to, to Gavin Brown, um, th th there is, you know, we, we, we've talked quite extensively within the, um, the Joint Exchequer Committee about um, the appropriate arrangements that should be put in place. Um, some of what the UK government was arguing for I, I think is unnecessary and, and, and I think I've successfully persuaded them it's not necessary. Um, but the key aspects that have mattered to the agreement have been the uh, formulation of um, official forecasts on GDP and on revenues and uh, that, that point is beyond dispute. 
Okay, I wonder whether I might push at what appears to be a slightly open door um, and ask you about the sustainability of public finances and how you as a government are meeting the fiscal rules, both areas we felt that the Fiscal Commission uh, might benefit from having a role in. I think, well, I'll, I'll consider these points. I think the, 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 the point on, I, I'm, I'm not sure, I suppose I'd be keen to understand from Jackie Bailey what she means by fiscal rules. Because I'm clear what, what I mean by fiscal rules. If, 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 if I've got a fiscal rule that says um, your revenue borrowing is at a limit of 300 million, I know what the rule is. Um, so if it's matters like that, then these are clearly matters of public report. Um, but you know, I, I'm certainly, if Jackie Bailey wishes to write to me with her suggestions on this point, I'd be, I'll happily consider them. I would even be happy to come and meet with you along well, with colleagues. Well, well, that might the, the, be, the, the, be quicker the, 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 and more the, persuasive. We'll have, a, we'll have a regular queue at my <laughs> office door seeking okay. meetings on this question. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, can I come on to the review, um, which obviously is for March 2022? Um, I've heard what you've outlined, and I think that that is um, a reasonable framework. I'm curious to know, if one party disagrees, what happens then? Because what I wouldn't want, as some commentators seem to have suggested, is that this discussion, debate, argument indeed, has been put off for five years. Um, so I'm curious to know what happens when one party disagrees. My um, desire would be to avoid that happening. But I think the crucial point, which is the guarantee for um, the public of Scotland, is that there's nothing that can be imposed upon us because there is a requirement for this to be jointly agreed. Now, I think Jackie Bailey um, has... Well, I'm not sure if Jackie Bailey has been sceptical about the possibility of the government not getting to an all. agreement here, but here I am with an agreement with which I'm not, about which I'm not complaining. I'm saying I've not got everything I wanted, but I'm not here complaining about it. So we're able to do... We're able to secure agreements and... Um, I think if I look at the, the movement that the United Kingdom government has made in the Scotland Bill, for example, um, I pressed for that movement to be undertaken and the UK government undertook that movement because I felt that was necessary to deliver what the Smith Commission envisaged. So I, I hope members would reflect that, and Jackie Bailey might even be able to reflect on this point herself, that maybe the Scottish government... Um, is making reasonable points in some of these arguments to ensure that we uh, d deliver the necessary agreements that we're, that, that we're required to deliver. And the Cabinet Secretary will be more than aware that my position was very supportive of the Government. It was. And indeed to suggest he remained at the table until they got that agreement. So, you know, let me stick that to one side because I think there is an issue here that we just need to understand. If both governments disagree, and it might be the UK government, it might not be the Scottish, but if both governments disagree, what then happens? And I recognise nothing can be imposed for the future, but do we go back to something? And what do we go back to? Well, I think my, my, my view, I, I, we are getting into hypothetical territory here, and, I, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm unwilling to, to, to speculate on what may happen. We have a, a mechanism in place which I think gives us the um, the confidence that nothing can be imposed on Scotland. The process will be informed by an independent report, to which we have um, uh, we have will have supported and participated in its formula, well, not its formulation, in establishing the independent report. That will inform the process, and from that um, we will be able to. Um, have a, an informed discussion with the United Kingdom government about these questions, informed by the experience of an entire parliament. I, I suppose I accept all of that. I accept that you have a mechanism that you feel comfortable with, and I think is certainly you know, something that, that, that I find favour with. I accept that nothing will be imposed. I suppose my question is wanting to understand you know, exactly what all of the potential scenarios are, um, what happens if there is a fundamental disagreement, the parties remain in a position that it's not necessarily the intransigence of the Scottish Government, it might be the UK Government for that matter. What happens then to the financial stability of the Scottish Government? That's what I'm interested in. And, and, and I, that's a, a position which, um, as I've said in my earlier answer, 
um, is a hypothetical position. It's um, w we will we have put in place arrangements which enable us to deliver um, no detriment over the uh, the period to 2022. We have secured the preservation of our uh, negotiating status on an equal basis with the Treasury at 2022 with a process to be informed by an independent report. And um, I think that's a very um, reliable um, set of arrangements that are in place to protect the Scottish interest. I absolutely agree with that. My problem is understanding what the consequences would be if there was no agreement. And I think it is of value to this Parliament, this committee, to understand precisely what's at stake. Because whilst you have agreed no detriment for a period of five years, which we absolutely support, um, I am worried that if a consequence of not reaching agreement, that that is not preserved beyond that period. And I think there's a shared well, interest. Well, well, on that point, on that scenario Jackie Bailey has put to me, that could not happen because nothing can be imposed upon us. OK, so we keep what we've currently got so and there is no change. I'm simply saying to Jackie Bailey that the scenario she puts to me could not happen because nothing can be imposed upon us. OK, can I ask then, just, just so I'm clear, right, does that mean we keep what we would have then and there's no reduction, there's no change? What I've tried to do is okay. to give as definitive an answer as I can within the context of the agreement and I think that's the, the firmest response I can give to Jackie Bailey. OK, thank you very much. Um, obviously, the value of Barnet to Scotland's public finances has really come to the fore during these discussions. Um, have you undertaken any uh, analysis of the value of Barnet, and could that be shared with the committee? Uh, well, well, the, 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 the Barnet formula is applied every, uh, every f fiscal event, so it's, uh, you know, we see the implications of that in our, in our budgets, which I think we're discussing this afternoon. OK, I'll pursue that separately. Finally, one, one technical question. In terms of resource borrowing, um, you talked about £300 million per annum was your ability to borrow for forecast errors. Is there a threshold to that? Does some of that lie, the responsibility lie with the Scottish Government, if you got that wrong? Because my understanding of the current powers is that that is the case. It's that, that, that's forecast error for... Um, the taxes for which we are responsible. Yep, I understand that. I'm asking about the threshold at which that is triggered. For example, just now, my understanding is it's triggered, um, I think the figure might be £150 million. Pounds. Um, there is a percentage that if you get wrong, you have to cover that first element of before you can borrow. No, so there's no, no threshold. No threshold no. Okay, thank you, convener. Thank you, Jean, to be followed by John. Thank you. I, I too was, was really quite interested in the Barnett formula because although the committee has taken evidence from lots of people, there was always a mystery surrounding Barnett, um, including from people who are involved with the Treasury and actually how that works. And I noticed through everything that we are talking about that having clarity and being, uh, in fact, I would imagine for the first time, if, if that's the case, being uh, clear as to the the uh, calculations that are that are done on the Barnett formula. Would you agree with that? The the calculations that are, that are applied on the Barnett formula are, in my view, pretty open. Um, essentially, they are driven by um, two factors, two documents. Uh, one is the statement of funding policy, which includes within it um, a set of comparability indicators, which, for example are on health, so if there's a change to health expenditure in England, there is 100% comparability for Scotland on, on, on health, because it's an entirely devolved function. On some other functions, uh, well, for, on defence, for example, there is a zero comparability. So if there is an increase in defence expenditure, there is no consequential benefit to Scotland, um, uh, to the Scottish block of expenditure. If there's an increase in health expenditure, there is a population share of the 100 the, 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 of, of the entirety of the increase in health expenditure in England, and um, so the, the the comparability indicators are included in the statement of funding policy. 
Um, the OBR will publish now um, a set uh, of numbers which will look at the change within the uh, of the policy decisions that are made by the United Kingdom government. So, let's, for example, if the UK government was to increase health expenditure by £500 million, that would be recorded by the Office for Budget Responsibility. They would have scrutinised that, and then the comparability factor would be applied to that for health. And at every fiscal event, um, I receive a, a spreadsheet from the UK government which shows me the change in the uh, budget lines. So, let's take, for example, 500 million for health, that gives us a consequential. 500 million for defence, zero consequential. I can see all that. I scrutinise all of that. My officials go through that with a fine tooth comb to make sure that what was intended in Barnet changes is actually delivered. And, I, and you know, and some every periodically, the statement of funding policy will be reviewed to look at those comparability indicators. Um, but. Uh, you know, generally, that's a it's a that's a pretty transparent process. Whether it's widely understood is a completely different question, <laughs> but reasonably widely uh, reasonably transparent. Thank you. Um, if and I guess this is a what if scenario, but if if taxes in the rest of UK were increased for a reserved power or a reserve matter. I mean, you mentioned defence. How would that affect uh, taxes in Scotland? It, it, well, if it, it, it depends which which tax was increased. Uh, let's let's say it was in, um, um, national insurance contributions. That would affect Scotland because that's not a devolved tax. Mm -hmm. If it was income tax, it would be income tax in. In, in England, in the rest, sorry, the rest of the United Kingdom, that would be increased because we will have the power over non-savings, non-dividend, non-dividend income tax uh, within Scotland. A tax specifically raised for reserve powers that, if, that who, Scotland would have a share of that. I mean, for example, if they raise tax to pay for Trident. Uh, so we, we, would there not be, therefore, consequentials on the Barnett formula that would reduce that in Scotland? Um, what because would we would be paying well, 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 equally, as, as, as you say, for the health service, where it's an increase, we would be given our share. But if there's an increase on reserved matters that we have a share, is the, is, is our, the Barnett formula then adjusted accordingly? Well, this is essentially... Um, an issue that's resolved in the strategic choices uh, of the United Kingdom government across public expenditure in the United Kingdom. So it's, it's essentially, um, the UK government undertakes its spending review processes and it will decide how much money it's going to spend on health, how much money it's going to spend on education, how much money it's going to spend on um, rural affairs, how much money it's going to spend on defence. And it will it will make those decisions uh, at United Kingdom government level and it will make its tax decisions about how it's going to fund those decisions. What will then be undertaken is the Barnet formula will then be applied to those decisions that are taken in the rest of the UK. Now, if there has been a very significant increase in defence expenditure to pay for, for example, the renewal of Trident, that will mean within the fiscal envelope less money is available to spend on services from which we might get a consequential. So the UK government is, within its powers, able to spend money on defence. Um, let's, for argument's sake, say that reduces the amount of money it can spend on health. So when the, the Barnet consequentials are applied, we get no benefit um, in the block grant from the money spent on defence. And whatever happens to the health Budget. Let's say, for argument's sake, the health budget was cut to um, to undertake to facilitate the defence expenditure. Um, we would see a negative consequential arising out of that. Right. Thank you. Uh, the um, the no detriment principle was, and it's been referred to already, uh, open to interpretation, I guess. But are you are we sure that, given Scotland's much smaller tax base and tax revenue and 
population growth expected to be less um, and has been than in the rest of UK. How do we, how is, does the no detriment principle kick in to ensure that we will always have that uh, higher per, per head spending? The, essentially, the, 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 the Scottish bloc, um, and this, this is a point which I don't think is widely recognised or understood, uh, the Scottish bloc already carries population risk because the Barnett formula is a, is a product of population. So if Scotland's population um, um, is a larger proportion of the UK population in year five than it was in year one, then that will have an effect on the calculation of the Barnett formula. Um, so population is already a risk that is carried by the Scottish Government uh, through the exercise of the Barnett formula because Barnett fundamentally is a population-based formula and it, uh, it looks at the relativity of population between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. In relation to um, the, uh, the question of no detriment, what essentially um, the view I took from the Smith Commission report was that the Smith Commission report at Clause 95.1 um, argued for the, that the Scottish block of public expenditure should continue to be determined by the exercise of the Barnett formula. So, to me, that, that's, the, that's the why I used the words that I used in my introductory statement. That is the test of no detriment. What should we have got out of the Barnett formula? That's the test. And therefore, the uh, block grant adjustment mechanism must not in any way undermine that Barnett line. And that's essentially what I've secured. And it wasn't on the table 11 months ago. Believe you me, it wasn't on the table 11 months ago. Um, uh, something very different was on the table 11 months ago, a proposition called Levels Deduction, which over a 10-year period would have reduced <coughs> our budget by £7 billion. Um, and just... Uh, finally, Cabinet Secretary, the, although, uh, and I'm pleased that you're content that we have a, an agreement, um, it does still feel that we have, although the Barnett formula may, uh, will be adjusted and, and that you're content, no detriment and all of that, and that we're, we're secure, we still have no power to grow our population. So, in fact, in, in many ways, we're working with the system as is, without the levers, as you might call them, of, of actually having the power to uh, react to a, a, a smaller population or being able to grow that. Is that true? I think that's a fair, I think it's a fair assessment. And that's the, that's the, you know, you know the, the, it's a really a product of the conclusions of the Smith Commission. Uh, I argued for more economic responsibility and economic levers to be devolved to the Scottish Government, the Scottish Parliament, in the Smith Commission. And, well, well Gina Kirk can see how far I got <laughs> by the product of the Smith Commission report. Um, but it's, um, uh, but I think there's, there's very legitimate issues there, that we are constrained in our ability to grow the economy by the availability of the economic levers. And that's why I think the application of the no detriment principle in the fashion that I have set out is so important in this agreement. Thank you. Okay, um, John to be followed by Leslie. Uh, thanks convener and uh, well first of all congratulations uh, Cabinet Secretary uh, on getting the agreement. Uh, I wasn't sure where we were going with that and I have to say I felt some of the opposition parties were not quite as committed to holding the line as you have been. Uh, so the fact there's no detriment uh, is excellent. Uh, obviously, I did hear you uh, giving us the main concession when you were asked on the radio the fact of the Fiscal Commission and that it's going to be doing the forecasting, and clearly I am very disappointed about that. Uh, however, I do accept that um, that is one of the compromises that had to be made. Uh, do you anticipate more resources being required for the Fiscal Commission because of this? There will be, yes, sir, without a doubt. Yes, because so I probably I, I, I suspect I probably better prepare the committee for a supplementary financial memorandum. Well, that was kind of well. where I was. Uh, I, I know how I know how sticky the committee is on financial memorandums, so I, I, I better keep myself on the right side of that requirement. Uh, uh, but quite. since but since 
since the convener is such an enthusiast for these arrangements, um, it will be, um, I'm sure that will be accommodated. Well, it will probably fall to myself then to question whether the, the amount of money is too generous. Um, because I did feel, I suppose, that already the, what they were getting was pretty generous. Uh, so we shall see. Have we any reaction from the Fiscal Commission members? I mean, are they definitely willing to carry on in their roles uh, given these new I haven't plans? I, I, I was able at the, week, at the weekend to uh, advise Lady Rice that I thought this may be a possibility. Uh, I haven't, since last night, I've been rather... Um, uh, I've not had the opportunity to speak to Lady Rice since the agreement was made yesterday afternoon, but I had forewarned her that this may be a possibility. And I'm, of course, very keen to discuss these issues uh, with uh, Lady Rice and the other members of the Commission uh, to establish that particular point. Obviously, I'll uh, report accordingly to the committee. And I take it uh, that we're not being given any resources from Westminster, despite the fact they want us to have this enhanced role? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to accommodate that within the, um, the, the, the wider capital and set-up costs um, that we have. Fair enough. Uh, now, VAT has been mentioned, um, and you, you said 19, uh, sorry, 2019-20, I think, for bringing that in. I, I mean, am I right in thinking that will not require any legislation on our part, or, or does it? No. No. And can, can you clarify for us how the VAT, what's been agreed as to how we get our share of VAT? Because one of the questions before was, is it purely at the time of final spend, eh, when the consumer buys the biscuit, or um, are we getting any share of the value added by a factory, say, which happens to be built in Scotland? The, the, the the approach that we've agreed in principle is a consumption-based approach, but uh, as I indicated to um, one of the members of the committee, I just can't quite think it was Mr Brown perhaps, um, the methodology is um, essentially this is, a, this, is a, this is a new territory for um, uh, assignation. Um, so we will have to work through many of these questions of detail with the United Kingdom government as part of the process. But but it is it, what has been agreed is it's consumer based. Yeah, it's consumption so based. Yeah, building a factory or expanding a factory in Scotland would not automatically give us an uplift in VAT. I think I, I think without I think I'd be I'd prefer not to venture into some of the detail of this without us being able to do some more work. I think we've got plenty of opportunity, and 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 and, and very and I'm very keen to understand the committee's perspectives on some of these questions so that that can be inform us in terms of taking forward this, this work. But we are, we are literally in a territory where there is no um, methodology on the shelf that we could just take down to apply. So I'm keen that I don't, um, I don't get into territory that we've not yet defined. No, that's, that's absolutely fair. That's fine. Uh, I, I just think VAT is one, perhaps, that hasn't had the scrutiny that some other sectors uh, of this have had. So yeah. going forward, I'm sure... We'll all be keen to look at that. I mean, could you just clarify for us what will need legislation in the Scottish Parliament? Um, I mean, I'm assuming APD will. I'm assuming all the welfare side will. Is there legislation required around income tax? I, I wouldn't think, uh, other than... I don't think there will be any requirement because I, I would just need to look at the mechanism about how the Scottish rate of income tax, but we'll have, it will be, it's, yeah, I think, I think we'll, 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 what we'll have, I think the, the, the resolution making powers that we use for the Scottish rate of income tax, which of course we exercised a couple of weeks ago, um, are sufficient to enable us to exercise the new powers that, uh, under the Smith Commission. Um, so I don't think there'll be anything that's required. And in terms of the set up arrangements, obviously, the architecture of income tax devolution is now in place and ready to operate on the f on, uh, on the new financial year. In relation to welfare, there, uh, obviously there will be, if the government wishes to create um, a new welfare provisions, they will have to be legislated for. Um, the existing uh, welfare provisions um, will be able to be taken forward um, as they stand. Um, there will be no legislation required on capital borrowing or revenue borrowing. Um, um, 
it's certainly not required, then you know, I, I may decide to bring forward legislation uh, in relation to the creation of uh, some of the fiscal um, ar arrangements, uh, such as amendments to the Tax Powers and Revenue Scotland Bill, if I judge that to be necessary. But I don't think there's a requirement for legislation. Um, on the, uh, and I think that probably is about it, I would think. Oh, the Fiscal Commission, obviously, there'll have to be some stage three amendments on, on, on the Fiscal Commission. That's fine. I mean, admin costs have been mentioned, and in particular around welfare, the, I think, 200 million and the ongoing 66 or whatever each year. Um, I mean, with the Scottish rate of income tax, we've been somewhat at the mercy of HMRC uh, as to what their charges would be. I, t I take it that continues to be the case for increased income tax powers, that it will be very much dependent on what they want to charge us, and we'll have to pay all of that? It w we will have to, um, but... I, I obviously I want to reassure the committee and Mr Mason that the government um, looks very closely at the estimates that are um, put forward in this respect. Uh, we exercise significant control over these estimates and um, actually the, um, the HMRC has um, required less funding than we envisage they would require in the implementation of the uh, Scottish Rate of Income Tax. OK, and finally then, uh, the heads of agreement that we're expecting this week, I mean, quite how detailed will they be, or will they be more detailed in some areas than others? They'll be, um, they'll be pretty, um, pretty detailed. Um, uh, they'll have to be to provide the, um, the, the clarity that's required on these questions. Um, if I, um, I think I may have, I do, um, I have a draft of the heads of agreement in front of me, which uh, currently extend to um, about 19 pages so far, and um, uh, these predate the um, uh, issues that were resolved in the course of yesterday, so they'll have to be revised to take that into account. So um, they will be quite detailed, yes. Thanks so much. Leslie. Thank you. Can I first welcome the, the agreement? Um, but can I just ask... Sorry, and obviously we're trying to take in the details as we, and just considering them. Can I just ask, so the, the agreed model for the block grant adjustment, it's not explicitly indexed per capita deduction, but what you've, but the outcome, the, the results that have come out of the sort of, it's a wee bit of a fudge model you're comfortable with as they're similar to the outcome if it was a, indexed per capita deduction? In the um, agreement we reached yesterday, um, it might help the committee if I, if I read this into the record, um, the agreement says, for a transitional period covering the next Scottish Parliament, the governments have agreed that the block grant adjustment for tax should be affected by using the comparable model, brackets, Scotland's share, close brackets, whilst achieving the outcome delivered by the indexed per capita method for tax and welfare. This will ensure that Scotland's, the Scottish Government's overall level of funding will be unaffected if Scotland's population grows differently from the rest of the UK. So that's the, the wording that's been agreed. So in, in short, um, the UK Government's preferred comparability model um, is being um, reconfigured to deliver the outcome that would have been created by per capita index deduction. And that's either elegant or inelegant. I shall leave it to the committee to decide. Models are generally inelegant because there's always discussion and agreement, isn't there, and sort of compromise. Can I ask now about the, you said about the 600 million for economic shocks and the forecasting errors. Is that, and you said about the, there was three, so is that 600 in total? If there was an economic shock, or is it if if there was? So sorry, sorry. I'm just, just I'm trying to think. Is allowed? Can you spend the if they're assuming there was no forecast errors? Can you spend the six hundred million if there was an economic shock? I, I can borrow up to six hundred million yeah. for forecast and economic shocks. Uh -huh. So that would read to me as if if I had no forecast errors, I could borrow, if I wished, 600 million for 
economic shocks. Now, there are, I should possibly um, clarify for the committee, that is for what would be described as a Scottish, a Scotland only economic shock. If there was a UK economic shock, then that's a UK macroeconomic issue and the UK takes its decisions in relation to these questions. If there was a, 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 a Scotland specific shock, um, that is triggered when onshore Scottish GDP growth is below 1% in absolute terms on a rolling four quarter basis um, and 1% below UK GDP growth over the same period. So there's a rule that specifies what is a Scottish only economic shock, which will be part of the agreement. And that is what has to be triggered to enable a, the Scottish Government to undertake any resource borrowing to deal with uh, an economic shock. Okay, and, and that's onshore. And I, if I could, perhaps, Sorry, if I could yeah. put, perhaps also add, that is one of the reasons why, because there is a, a, an issue about um, a GDP measures being used, why the United Kingdom government was keen to have a forecast of GDP undertaken by the Fiscal Commission. And, and you, but you said it's onshore, so oil and gas, that would still be considered as UK if there was a... Well, the... the, the, the the the, the 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 fiscal regime of the uh, oil and gas sector is entirely within the competence of the United Kingdom government. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just trying to yeah, understand. Okay, so following up from that, I think you'd said. I'm just trying to see if, I, if my understanding is correct. The cumulative debt stock regarding that borrowing for the resource, so sort of the revenue income. Was limit the limit is 1.75 billion. So, so if there was almost so it need to be like three years, wouldn't it? If you were spending that 600 million, if mm. there was a sort of downturn, and th then we would need to then repay that. If there was three years of 600 million ex extra spend in year four we would need to start paying that back because it needs to be repaid within a three to five year period. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Okay. And that, you know, I think that's what I would consider to be some of the elements of the, f the fiscal rules and the exercise of fiscal responsibility that, you know, if, if, if uh, you know, without sort of, nailing my colours to the mast, if you had two years in which you were borrowing for economic shocks at £600 million per annum, I think you'd be needing to take some action to remedy that uh, pretty soon. Can I, one last thing about the population. Um, What is the Scottish Government doing? Because obviously the population is inflows, but actually it outflows as well. People leaving Scotland, going elsewhere for jobs. Especially when I think about when I used to teach at the university, and quite a lot of the students were, would leave Scotland and go, whether it be Australia, New Zealand, or even in, into England. So I suppose about ensuring our population, what, what other factors could will the Scottish Government be doing to make sure that actually we try to keep our own population here? We we um, we have a very keen interest as a government in encouraging the growth of the Scottish population, whether that's by um, um, encouraging people to come to live here who live elsewhere just now, or by encouraging people who have been educated here to stay here. Now there are a variety of things that we do. A lot of that is driven by the economic climate and the economic opportunities, and we spend a lot of our time. I spend a lot of my time with the university sector trying to make sure that we have um, uh, exciting research and development opportunities that enable people to see their future being here. A whole variety of different interventions to try to encourage people to, to come to Scotland and to live here. But there will be um, mechanisms and incentives that we would like to have at our disposal. The um, post-study work visa is a very good example where the Smith Commission said that we, um, we would be we should make progress on this question. 
and um, I think virtually every university principal in the country believes we should make progress on the post-study work visa, but the UK government said, no, we're not having it. So it's an example of where we might have laudable aspirations here in Scotland, but we can't fulfil them because the UK government said we're not doing that. And um, I hope that uh, we can get some movement on some of these questions in due course. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Uh, that's concluded questions from committee members. I'll just get a couple of others just to, to round up. Um, I mean, the first one basically is, I mean, what role do you envisage for the Joint Exchequer Committee as we go forward, you know, in terms of uh, implementation of the framework? Uh, the Joint Exchequer Committee will have an ongoing role in taking forward the fiscal framework. It will be an essential part of the governance arrangements of the um, of the uh, fiscal framework, and uh, I would expect it to to remain very closely connected to the development of the of the framework. Okay, and just uh, uh, finally, I mean, will the framework provide a breakdown of the adjustment of the block grant for each of the individual devolved taxes? Um, the I, I don't know how much detail we will go into, um, other than the fact that um, the comparability factors for tax will be included within the agreement. Um, but then, the essentially, the agreement is there to set the rules, and the application of those rules will then be evidenced by the material that emerges. Um, through the, um, comp the, the formulation of the Scottish Block of Expenditure. So it will be clear to us from the numbers that emerge at each fiscal event. OK, thank you for that. Are there any further points you would wish to make to the committee before we wind That's up? Well, I would like to thank you for, as always, answering our questions so comprehensively. I suppose the one thing I should say, Convener, is that if, in the light of the committee receiving the heads of agreement, if the committee wishes to see me again, I would be happy to come back at uh, a time suitable to the committee to uh, make sure that the, the committee has the opportunity to fully scrutinise the heads of agreement before feeding its, its contribution into the, the work of the Devolution for the Powers Committee. I understand, just as I left uh, my office this morning, that the Devolution for the Powers Committee has asked to see me again, having um, seen me yesterday, so, which obviously uh, they saw me before the fiscal f uh, agreement had been reached. But uh, if the committee wished to see me again, I, I would do everything I can to try to accommodate that request. Yes, well, I think that's more or less a certainty that we, we do, actually. And we're looking to have Mr Hands here next week also. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm now um, uh, close the public session, uh, and I'll have a couple of minutes break. Uh, to allow the official report members of the public and our witnesses to leave.